very warm welcome, everyone, to this evening's development study seminar. Um, my name's Jay Lingham. I'm one of the organizing committee for the seminar series. We are delighted to be joined this evening via Skype by Dr. Marcus Taylor from Queen's University in Canada, who will be talking about climate change and the new green revolution in India. We actually um, invited Marcus to join us in person from Canada, but he requested to join via Skype. Um, he didn't want to take a long-haul flight to then come and talk about climate change. And given the urgency of this topic, um, this kind of technology is potentially something we should all be using more of for the future. Marcus is an associate professor in the Department of Global Development Studies and School of Environmental Studies at Queen's University, Kingston in Canada. He researches and teaches on the political ecology of development with a focus on agriculture, labor, and livelihoods. His recent books include The Political Ecology of Climate Change Adaptation and Global Labor Studies. He's currently completing a manuscript on Climate Smart Agriculture, a Critical Introduction. We're also delighted to be joined this evening by two discussants, Professor Kate Soper and Dr. Nithya Natarajan. Um, Kate is Professor Emerita of Philosophy at London Metropolitan University and was a visiting professor at Brighton University. She's published widely on environmental philosophy, aesthetics of nature, theory of needs and consumption, and cultural theory. She's been a member of the editorial collectives of Radical Philosophy and New Left Review, and a regular columnist for the US journal Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. And she's currently working on a book on alternative hedonism about the key role of changed consumption and the reconceptualization of prosperity and progress in meeting the challenges of climate change. Nithya is a postdoctoral research associate on the Blood Bricks Project at Royal Holloway University of London. Her work there focuses on debt bonded brick workers in Cambodia and how they came to be debt bonded through a trajectory of rural indebtedness in climate change affected villages across the Mekong Delta. She's also an ESRC doctoral scholar based at SOAS, where her research centers on agrarian transition and environmental change among tobacco farmers and traders in Tamil Nadu, South India. Nithya's work cuts across the fields of human geography, development studies, and agrarian political economy. So Marcus, who you can just see in the very top corner of the screen, will be talking for 45 to 50 minutes. Um, Nithya and Kate will then comment for five to seven minutes each, after which we will open up the discussion to questions from the floor. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtags SOASDevStudies, and ESRC. So over to Marcus then. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Jay. I'm, 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 I'm wondering, can everyone hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. Is, thank you. Oh, that's superb. And thank you so much. Thanks so much for Faisy for, for organizing, Jay for introducing, and uh, Kate and Nifia. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you uh, a part of this panel. Thanks so much. And thanks so much to SOAS for allowing me to enforce this uh, technological challenge of doing the uh, talk from, from distance. Uh, uh, it would be absolutely wonderful to be there with you. Uh, I would, don't get me wrong, I would love to be in London right now visiting uh, all of you. Um, and particularly as I hear it's plus 20 degrees or something absolutely crazy of that nature. Um, but that's the point. The reason that I'm doing this remotely is because I didn't feel comfortable taking a flight just to give a, a talk about climate change impacts and so forth. Uh, so uh, thank you for your patience with the uh, technology. And I hope this is perhaps something of a template of how many more academic talks can be done in the future to, to allow people to connect over great distances without uh, obviously the carbon and emissions. So let's think of this as a climate friendly talk. Okay, so what am I talking about today? I want to introduce you to some of the recent research I've been doing on uh, agrarian change and environmental change in southern India. Um, it's almost impossible to discuss agriculture and rural India uh, these days without talking about agrarian crisis. This uh, notion of crisis, of a countryside in crisis, really haunts many debates uh, over India. Uh, and, and people talk to about the nature of crisis in Indian agriculture in a number of ways. To be clear, 
it is not agriculture itself that's in crisis. Indian agriculture still remains uh, productive uh, and uh, with yields, etc., but rather the social components and the environmental components of agriculture. Uh, you may be familiar uh, with different kind of indices of sort of social distress. Uh, there's been accounts of uh, falling incomes, uh, of poor nutrition, of escalating indebtedness among particularly the smallholder and marginal popu uh, farmer population of rural India. Perhaps most notably, this gets shown in questions of farmer suicides. There has been a lot of uh, media attention about farmer suicides uh, across India, but particularly in the regions that I'm going to be talking about today. And these are farmers typically that have fallen into debt and uh, most uh, uh, regrettably decide to end their own lives rather than face the social stigma of not being able to pay debts because their uh, agriculture wasn't remunerative enough. At the same time, there's been an explosion of protests uh, the Modi government, uh, the, the national government of India, has seen uh, farmers protesting, walking, marching to Delhi, uh, and some very dramatic uh, protests in, 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 in the capital and in other places to mark the, the, the fear of agriculture not providing livelihoods to people. And on top of that, there's a growing question about the environmental basis for agriculture, uh, particularly questions of water depletion, uh, of soil erosion, and of course, the big one that uh, we talk about that overlays much of these dynamics, which is, of course, con uh, climate change, uh, manifested potentially in terms of droughts, erratic rains. Uh, so too much water, not enough water, water when you expect it, but then water when you don't expect it kind of questions. So the relationship of climate change is sort of overlying this. And this kind of comes to this idea of agricultural crisis. Now, let's be clear, the Indian government, both uh, nationally, but also the, the, the regional state governments, uh, introduced lots of programs to try and tackle simultaneously uh, agricultural development, uh, rural, develop more, rural development more widely and climate change adaptation or climate resilience. And um, I've been very fortunate to be able to look at three of these programs in conjunction with uh, colleagues in India uh, over the last uh, four years. Uh, so particularly working with a colleague, uh, Suhas Basme, um, who's based currently in Athri, the Ashoka Trust for Environment and Ecology in Bangalore. So what I want to do is talk through these case studies and use each one of them to open a bit of a different window on contemporary rural India, challenges of development, development projects, climate change adaptation, and so forth. And from each case study, I want to try and draw out one point from each. And then in the conclusion, I'll try and stick them together and talk a little bit on a more general level. So uh, in terms of the three case studies, um, they are um, uh, based around different parts of South India. Uh, I don't know if you can see the pointer on the map. No, you can't because I can't even see it on my own computer. Okay, but the, two, the three case study sites is firstly um, in Telangana, which is the, those two green, uh, sorry, green, uh, yellow dots uh, towards the top end of the map. Uh, Hyderabad is the capital city of Telangana state uh, and uh, Dalatabad, uh, which is the area where I've been doing some research on the system of rice intensification. Then uh, after that, uh, our research moved more to the South, you'll see uh, Tunkaru and Mandia highlighted, and I'm going to talk about hybrid rice propagation in Mandia and climate resilient village projects in Tunkaru. Um, and so those are going to be three case studies. What ties these case studies together and why that I'm going to try and go through each is the fact that they're, well, firstly, they're all public pro projects. They're all government-driven uh, initiatives, and they're government-driven initiatives to try and simultaneously address questions of rural development and environmental change. Uh, particularly, we could say that something that captures binds them all together is this idea of climate smart agriculture. And this is a relatively new buzzword, a relatively new rubric, which has been used not just in India, but globally to discuss the sort of future of agriculture, of rural development, etc. Um, these days, all international institutions are using this rubric to uh, make claims about policies, to organize what they do, 
Uh, you'll see by, just by these titles of recent publications here, we got The Future of Food, Shaping a Climate Smart Global Food System. That's a World Bank publication. Uh, but also the other document, we got SIAT, uh, Center for International Tropical Agriculture, CGR, the, uh, the consortium group on international agricultural research, World Bank, and so forth and so forth. All institutions are trying to get into this idea of climate change, uh, smart agriculture, and the Food and Agriculture Organization would be the same. The idea of climate smart agriculture is that to move to shift agricultural systems to uh, new technologies and new techniques and cultivation practices that do sort of three, three things. The idea of promoting yields, increasing yields, simultaneously to embedding climate resilience within agricultural systems, so the ability to be able to deal with shocks and stresses from a changing climate. Uh, and alongside, wherever possible, decreasing emissions from agriculture. Although, to be fair, that third one ends up being a less prominent than the other two when we're talking about developing world agriculture. And so this idea of climate smart agriculture, all the three aspects that I'm looking at, the three programs, have been sort of uh, put together under this rubric. The other rubric that they sort of touch upon is the one that's in the, the, the title of my talk, and that is the idea of a new green revolution in India. So um, 2016 marked a 50, cent, a 50 years from the idea of the initiation of the original green revolution in India. Uh, there was a lot of public uh, talks and a lot of public um, uh, sort of conferences around what it means for, for to be 50 years. Uh, the, the, the farmer you see in the photo was one of the very first um, practitioners of uh, green revolution technologies. IR8 was the, uh, the rice uh, variety that had been produced as a green revolution crop. And there he is uh, 50 years later um, looking at, uh, you can't see too well, but the board in front of him 50 years later is sub one a which is a, a, a flood tolerant rice variety that's been developed, etc. And this is still an active farmer, uh, 50 years still using these more advanced uh, rice varieties and technologies, etc. So in, 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 in India, climate smart is kind of hinged this idea of finding a new green revolution, one that can push yields forwards. And the idea that increasing yields will increase farm incomes, will address food security issues, will promote uh, rural development. But at the same time, the new green revolution must deal with the environmental strains upon agriculture, uh, massive water use and water wastage and uh, problems to do with climate change uh, and soil erosion. So what we're going to take a look at, and as I talk through these projects, one of the key things that in this idea of both climate smart agriculture and finding a new green revolution, much of the drift of these uh, programs have been focused on, on technologies, new agricultural technologies as the way to pioneer uh, more productive crops and more resilient crops, which can enable those triple goals of rural development, farmer incomes, and, and increasing food security. And this, of course, is very typical. For example, in, in, in climate smart agriculture, the idea of substituting older technologies for new ones as a way to achieve these kind of ends really appeals to policymakers because it simplifies the process of trying to intervene in rural in India. The idea that simply getting farmers to adopt more modern, better, scientifically more advanced crops, inputs, cultivation techniques, reduces the problems of rural India to a question of techniques. We can simply get farmers to substitute one set of practices with another, and create the aims we want. And this, this is like manna from heaven for development projects uh, because it creates a certain kind of simplicity to them. There's a clearly stated purpose to them, substitution of technology or practices, and the idea is that will mechanically lead to certain outcomes which are beneficial and can be mapped. And within this, we often see then that the, the idea that the problem primarily is farmers themselves. It's a question of getting new information and better technologies to farmers, but also either convincing them, persuading them, or just flat out coercing them to adopt the better technologies which are developed elsewhere. And this is, of course, long standing.
interesting way of approaching agricultural development. It's still very much alive and well in rural India today. So what I'm going to show you is that why I find this approach to be quite problematic. And I'm going to show the three projects uh, turn by turn and talk about why in many respects that they sort of failed to deliver the goals that they, they, they were um, supposedly uh, uh, set up to do. And the particularly within that is because they silence key questions and key issues in rural is India. They don't talk about questions of power. They don't talk about questions of rural hierarchy. They don't talk about questions of social relations. And these are really intimate aspects of rural India. And, and it's virtually impossible to understand how new technologies work or fail to work without embracing these kind of complexities of power and hierarchy. But government programs really don't want to cross that train, the messy political train, and therefore they simplify uh, in ways that I'm going to show you. So just very briefly, my, my, my um, broader approach to understanding new agricultural technologies, agrarian change and so forth is rooted in political ecology. I don't know uh, how familiar you would all be with a political ecology perspective, but three main elements of it. Very briefly, this is not meant to be a, a, a theoretical talk. We'll get to the empirics very quickly. But, you know, free basis, firstly, basis in agrarian political economy. In the words of sort of Henry Bernstein, the idea of, you know, we need to understand who owns what, who does what, who gets what, and what do they do with it in rural settings. And, you know, that's a sort of template of thinking about uh, rural power structures, rural social relations in order to understand how new technologies are embedded or fail to embed. Particularly, I'm interested in questions of access and control. So who has access to certain uh, productive resources or who has control over them? And as you'll see in what I'm about to discuss, big issues are obviously land, who has access to or control over land, but also water, labor, credit or credit and debt, uh, knowledge, who has access to knowledge and how what networks shape uh, knowledge in rural society, and common property resources, those resources that might be common grazing lands, access to forests and other aspects, who has control over those or access to them. So that's just sort of the meat of you know, agrarian political economy. Alongside that, a second pillar of political ecology I find very useful for my own uh, work is to focus on the politics of representation. So if we wanted to, to go beyond uh, Bernstein's sort of who owns what and who does what, this is a question of who defines what, who identifies problems and therefore is able to say what kind of solutions they are, who speaks for whom in rural society. Uh, so this po politics of representation of who can produce discourses around the issues. For example, climate smart agriculture is itself a discourse which represents the problems of rural India and other locations as an absence of the right kinds of technologies. And the solutions that fall for that become about getting the technologies into rural areas. Now, just quite simply, many rural social movements would not accept that framing, that discursive framing, or that representation of the problems of rural India. And so this question of who has power to define the debates is really important. That's a really important second pillar of political ecology for me. And the third one is perhaps the most uh, complex or, or controversial uh, in some way, and, and that is the question of how we understand the interaction between social dynamics and what we might call the environment or the ecological or the biophysical dynamics. And very often in, in sort of standard agrarian political economy, it's very anthropocentric. Social categories are seen to be the causal ones, class and commodities, etc. march out. And the environment seems to be very static. The environment, the sort of uh, what it seemed to be as nature is seen to be a, a sort of static terrain in which humans play out uh, their interactions. And so uh, I've sort of been influenced by some of the work coming out of actor network theory, uh, Latour and others to a certain measure. There's a lot of problems with it, but I'm really interested in understanding how biophysical processes uh, intermesh with social processes to create social environmental change, etc., in ways that there's no clear defining lines between what is social and what is natural. 
and so forth. And climate change really drives this process, for, uh, this issue home. Is climate change is neither social nor biophysical, but it's both together in many ways, right? So I'm going to try and bring that out. But when I look at questions of rice production, which has been, you know, my work, I'm interested in the interrelationships between everything, between the seeds themselves, plants, microbes, pests, uh, meteorological forces in terms of temperature, rain, etc., flows of water which humans try to shape, social patterns of seeding and weeding, the divisions of labor and divisions of knowledge in communities, uh, forms of credit, land tenure, marketing, commodity chains, and all of this going and how they all come together so that some biophysical processes are really important power in the social ones and vice versa in ways that get really sort of messy. So just keep that in the back of mind. It, it helps to explain how I approach these issues. I'm more than happy to elaborate on any of this uh, later on, in, but I really want to get to the empirical material, which is the sort of cut and thrust of the material. So on that sense, where am I looking? So the first project uh, that was um, that my... Um, uh, my colleague and I really looked at first is, is the system of rice intensification in Mahabugnagar district in Telangana. And Telangana is India's newest state. It was carved out from what was a unified Andhra Pradesh and it's become its own um, thing. And it's right there. And if you look at the, the, the left hand map in, this, you know, in the heart of, of, of peninsula India, um, and Mahabugnagar is, so on, on the left, you can see the state of Telangana. On the right, you can see where Mahabugnagar district is. And the villages that we looked at uh, were um, in the north end of that, so right up the, the sort of central north tip of that. We looked at about six villages. And we looked at six villages where there had been a government program. Um, sorry, actually, first of all, just to, to give you some detail. So this region of uh, central uh, South India is a semi-arid uh, region. Um, there is the monsoon period, and outside of the monsoon period, it is pretty dry. Um, so a lot of agriculture, and agriculture involves 60% of the, uh, the, the working population, uh, revolves around water. And particularly, uh, as you'll see with some of these photos, you get you can see the sort of typically the, the landscape is very dry, etc. Except where there's access to water, and that's often through bore wells. Uh, you know, digging down, drilling a well into water that's under underground. I will come back to that. Where water could be combined with land and human labor, you can get very fertile uh, areas. But overall, this is seen as um, in Indian terms, a backward region where there's lots of poverty, uh, a large smallholder and marginal um, landholder population, etc., where yields are not particularly high, uh, and where rice is farmed along with various forms of millets and various forms of cash crops, such as vegetables, tomatoes, maize, uh, and some lentils uh, for domestic consumption. So in this region, one of the ideas was to bring in this technique called the system of rice intensification. And um, this is uh, a, it's a, a way of cultivating rice that was developed in Madagascar, uh, but has become really uh, promoted among some circles uh, because it's suggested it's a way of increasing yields and reducing water use with only a change in cultivation patterns. So this doesn't need new inputs, new technologies of a material kind. Rather, it just needs farmers to change the way they grow rice. So uh, what you see before you is a, 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 a field planted in stream method. And this is a, a, I'll just quickly highlight what the differences are. So system of rice intensification involves farmers uh, planting their seeds in a very uh, patterned Fashion. This isn't. If you look at that field in the photograph, you'll see it's very ordered with square uh, quadrants in which there are rice plants in each uh, uh, corner of the squares uh, mapped out across the field. It's very linear and very organised. Uh, this is because, contrary to typical uh, rice production, um, the idea is to leave a lot of spacing between individual rice plants. The idea here is that you just want single rice plants, well spaced, so they grow incredible root structures. 
Uh, it's notable that when the rice is planted in this field, they always transplant from seedlings, and the seedlings they use are very young ones, uh, about half the age of normal rice plantation, under two weeks of age, so that you get very vigorous growth in the early system, and they can um, they can establish those roots. The other difference, and this is important for the climate change thing, is that you use less water. At the moment, you can see the field is flooded, but the idea is to use alternate wetting and drying. So you flood the field, and then you let it dry out. You don't keep a permanently flooded field like you would in standard rice cultivation. Uh, and the idea here is to let the air get to the soil. Uh, and this is meant to prove a much healthier biome for the rice. Uh, uh, the, 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 the paddy plants and the microorganisms in the soil and the oxygen, etc., create a much healthier to allow for vigorous growth. And this, the idea is, yes, you've got less rice plants in your, your field, but they tend to be much bigger with much more grain on them. So creating overall greater yield. And because you've used less water, less water. The other aspect of this is that you weed this field with a mechanical weeder. I'll come back to that in a second. So this has seemed to be a really interesting new technique uh, promoted uh, in order to try and increase rice yields. It involves a major shift in how people grow rice. It goes against traditional practices. Um, but the idea is that this can actually boost yields and save waters, making it a climate smart technology. And on this basis, the government of Andhra Pradesh and then once it became an independent Telangana launched programs to try and get this embedded in villages. So we're looking at some of the villages where this program had run about five years previously. And the, the, the program involved getting villages together, creating committees to promote this method, uh, training from university agricultural extension officers, subsidies in terms of fertilizer to try and get people to do it and to build up a real pattern in villages of people using this alternative method. So in that respect, um, Sri is meant to achieve great things. Um, and when we got to the village, uh, villages uh, about a year after the program had uh, ended, we were hoping to find, you know, the presence of Sri in fields. Uh, but we could not. We went to the villages, we looked at all the areas and we talked to the farms, etc., and virtually no one was using system rice intensification or SRI. Uh, and this confused us. And our, our first thing was, well, perhaps it doesn't work. There are some ag agronomists that claim uh, SRI is a bit of smoke and mirrors. It doesn't deliver the results that it suggested. But talking to farmers, this was not the case. Every farmer we talked to that had practiced it when the NGOs and the government had been in town promoting it said, yeah, we got better yield, somewhere between 5 and 15% increases, and we use less water, but we still don't use it now. So this became our question, why did this uh, fail? And there's a number of reasons for this, and they have little to do with culture of farmers not being able to accept new methods, etc., which was one of the official lines taken in this. On the contrary, it had much more to do with what we could call the agrarian political economy. So first thing, transplanting. You'll see here that this is a field uh, planted uh, not in Sri method uh, because we couldn't find it. I'd love to show you. The only time I saw Sri in a field was in the university chess fields. Uh, I could find no evidence of it in these villages despite major resources being pumped in over the previous four years. So uh, one of the questions is labor. And this wasn't addressed by the government uh, at all. But you will remember that uh, with Sri, you plant younger seedlings. So the seedlings you've seen being planted here are four weeks old. That's typical. Sri, you have to do it at a very specific time, 12 to 14 days. And so the first thing we noticed is that Sri might be a more productive system, but it's a much more detailed, much more finely choreographed system of cultivating rice. And this is what caused problems for farmers, because to, in order to have a much more finely tuned choreography of cultivation, you need control, not just over your own field, but over water, over labor, over access to credit and other things. So in terms of labor, in order to get people into your field at the precise moment that Sri says that you need to transplant your seedlings, it's really, it's really problem. Um, you have two days to do it to drive maximum results. And yet, transplanting is taken under, uh, in rural India, primarily by female transplantation labor groups. 
Some farmers had no problem getting these laborers in their fields at the time they wanted. And this tended to be farmers with greater land who could offer the groups like, you know, several days of consistent work, which they found very valuable, or farmers that had other aspects of social prestige and social power within the area. For example, one of the interviews we did was a, a, a sort of more affluent farmer that also ran an input store in the center of the village. And we're sitting there in, interviewing, and he said, yeah, no problem getting laborers whenever we need it. And it became very clear why, whilst we're sitting there interviewing him, because we kept getting interrupted by people coming to store and asking him for advice about which chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides to use, and then asking him to, to, to uh, purchase them on credit. So quite simply, in uh, uh, the rural power structure, this was a very powerful person. The labor groups knew that potentially their husbands and their households needed this guy for credit, for inputs, for advice, for knowledge, etc. So his fields would be the first dealt with. So when it came time for transplanting, he had no problem. On the flip side of it, those small and marginal farmers that uh, needed laborers, they were at the bottom of the pecking order. And they would get into bidding wars to try and bring in laborers at a time of relative labor shortage, given that many women were preferring to go and try and work in factories or migrating to cities rather than to work in the fields. And so one of the things that we noticed, that this was a social question, this was a labor question, an agenda question, which I'm going to come to in a minute, about who did work for whom and who had the power to make sure people are in the fields doing the labor. Now, in normal rice cultivation, this doesn't matter because you can transplant your rice any time around it being one month old. But with Sri being a really choreographed system and you need to try and do it between a certain amount of time, this caused a lot of problems. So uh, f many farmers just realized that there would be very late planting, and this certainly had an effect on, on their yields. Farmers that could get the laborers into the fields had the most benefits from Sri. Farmers that couldn't control labor in that way suffered, and their yields were far less. Equally, another aspect of the labor thing, when it comes to together agenda, when you uh, weed, normally in rural India, weeding, again, it's a very gendered division of labor, and it's handed out to female labor groups, as we're seeing in the previous uh, photo. However, under Sri method, because you don't flood the field, the weed problem is, 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 uh, is more significant. Uh, flooding the field suppresses weed, weeds. So you're meant to actually uh, weed with a, a, a mechanical weeder, which you can see here, this, uh, this gentleman showing um, uh, in the field. And it's a very rudimentary mechanical weeder. It's meant to turn up the soil. That's meant to help aerate the soil and, and kill the weeds. But the thing we noticed immediately is that a lot of men said, you know what, we can't be bothered to do three, even though it works by giving us a bit more yield because of this weeder system is terrible. And they said it's really hard work. And depending, uh, here you can see a gentleman with darker soil, that very uh, tough soil to move. Uh, the red soils you'll see in other photos are a bit easier, etc. But they complained that it was too onerous a task. What really they were meaning was that the balance of labor had passed from women weeding to men. And so it was about gender divisions of labor here. And there were actually, you know, uh, hand weeding is a very onerous task too. No, uh, the men weren't complaining about that because the women were doing it. But Sri changed the balance of it. And because uh, it seemed to be using a technology, uh, a mechanical weeder, that was seen to be men's work. Men had to do this and they frank, frankly didn't want to do it. So there's a strongly gendered aspect in there. The third aspect that we, we looked about is access to water. Now, Sri uses less water. Wonderful climate change, yeah? You know, with questions of water scarcity. The trouble is that Sri system, you need water at very specific times. And to get water, you needed one of these. What I'm showing you here is a photograph of a drilling rig uh, because water is basically, uh, you know, the monsoons come, the water pools, etc., and that's great for the fields while the rain's there. But after that period, most people are trying to draw water from underground uh, the rock formations capture water in pools underground, little underground lakes, and you get these guys to come drill down. It's very expensive and it's quite risky because you're not sure if you're going to hit one of the uh, underground lakes or not because they're fragmented between the rock formations, etc. And then you can attach a ball well and uh, pump water out and, and cultivate your rice. 
Um, so Sri system requires less water, but it requires it at very precise moments. And this made farmers very nervous because these bore wells have been increasingly dug all over the landscape. And farmers are quickly exploiting the amount of water within them. And if your neighboring farmer can drill deeper than you into the same underground aquifer, they can get that water. And if your well doesn't go down as far, you'll run out quickly and they'll keep pumping. And that leads to this. If you see in this photo here, this is a failed bore well in the sense that you'll see that the, 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 the crop is green to a certain area and then it goes yellow and it's dying. And that's because the water is no longer coming out in sufficient amount to irrigate the field. So why farmers were worried about SRI, using SRI, was because they felt if their bore well failed, then their, when their field had been dried out, they would lose the crop. Whereas the older flooded, men, uh, flooded um, system of growing rice, you still had an inch, several inches of water in the field at any time. So if your bore well failed, there's still a chance for rain to come uh, in the next few days and refill the aquifers and so forth. So it's a risk avoidance thing. They were worried about SRI because it made them very dependent on the bore wells, which they couldn't rely on, particularly as neighboring farms were digging down into the same aquifers. So there's a risk avoidance aspect. So here we found the, the, a main point to sort of draw out of this is not a question of whether a new technology works or not. We found that SRI worked in its explicit goals of increasing yield and using less water, but for whom it works and why. And we found that whilst more affluent uh, farmers who were able to control labor, who perhaps had better, deeper bore wells and um, were uh, able to employ other people to do the heavy work of pushing the weeder, were perfectly happy with SRI and they continue to use it, the small and marginal farmers that Sri was most meant to benefit found that they wouldn't do it. And they even said, yes, it gives us more yield. Yes, it gives us less water. But those questions of access and control mean that we can't use this new technology or we won't use it. So that's the first key point there with one little case study, okay? So I'm going to move on to a second case study to draw out some other aspects of it. But let's keep those questions of access and control in mind, all right? So the second project that we looked at uh, was in uh, Manja district in Karnataka, which is the state, if you look on the map on the left, uh, the large state in the southwest. And, and then if you look at the map on the right, that shows Karnataka state and it shows you where Mandya is. And Mandya is quite different from Mahabuknagar because Mandya is right next to the Calvary River and there's an integrated irrigation system of canals and, and so forth built out of this uh, Calvary River, uh, which was set up by British colonial authorities in the 20s, 30s, etc. And still functions today. So, so this is quite a different agroecological zone because of the canal. So, whilst um, climate change and climatic variability is still having a major impact on here, and I'll try and come to it, there's generally been a sense of more available water uh, within certain regions. And we came to this region particularly look at different kind of agricultural technology, uh, and that's the uh, technology. Uh, of hybrid rice seed. So on the one hand, whilst uh, Mandya is known as the sugarcane capital of India, you'll see the farmer on the left with his huge amount of harvested sugarcane, it actually produces more rice, uh, more cropped area goes to rice. On the right hand side there, you'll see uh, rice seedlings there in the little uh, field ready for transplanting as soon as the rain comes. We're there just expecting the monsoon. I think that's me in the background trying not to fall into the paddy field. Um, so this is, uh, this is an area of, 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 of rice, uh, rice cultivation, one of the bread baskets of southern India. And we're particularly interested in hybrid rice. So hybrid rice is a, is a technology which has uh, been heralded by uh, Indian policymakers to be the new cutting edge in raising yields. Uh, they're very worried that sort of older green revolution rice technologies, etc., the rate of growth of yields has kind of flattened out and stagnated. And they're interested in hybrid rice. Now, hybrid rice is where you take two varieties of rice uh, and you specifically choose them to have the properties you want in terms of both yield, but also size, disease resistance, pest resistance, suitability to local agroecological conditions. And you breed them together. 
And they, it's what's called the heterosis effect. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, where the first generation seed of any two parents uh, has uh, what's called hybrid vigor. For one generation, you get this real boost of, um, of, of growth, of yield, etc. And it only lasts for a single generation. Now, creating hybrid rice is really difficult because rice is a self-pollinating plant. So you can't just leave these two plants together in a field, turn off the lights and let them get on with it because the, the, they'll tend to self-pollinate. What you have to do is a really integrate process of, of pushing the plants together, of creating, grip, bringing a third line in which you create as sterile, etc. It's a really technically very sophisticated project and it's done in university and in private sector laboratories to create these uh, forms of hybrid rice. And the idea is that hybrid rice, you have to buy a new set each year. So it encourages the commercialization of agriculture, um, but it will give you a 15% plus yield advantage over the best standard high yielding varieties. So this is the idea that hybrid rice could push forward the yield frontier in Indian rice agriculture. Uh, and the particular variety we're looking at was this one, KRH4, which is Karnataka Rice Hybrid Number 4, produced in uh, the university um, agricultural system uh, in uh, Mandya. This is a regional agricultural uh, research center set up by the British colonial authorities and is going strong since. Um, and this was one that was specifically meant to work well in the irrigated South Indian agro environment. Uh, and in many respects, it is a, a remarkable technological accomplishment. Uh, it passes national tests for yield, for disease resistance, etc., really well. Uh, it's you know there should be a strong yield advantage over the best uh, comparators uh, that are being used in the fields of Mandia uh, at present. Uh, here's the agricultural university where it was produced, etc. And the scientists in this university uh, had really strong um, expectations for this hybrid rice. So we went, and again, we go, we, we time our visit about four years after it was first promoted, trialed, etc. cetera. The, the university had um, distributed it into fields. They'd offered training, they'd offered massive subsidies for farmers to take it in about six villages again. Uh, they'd tried to enlist local prestige farmers, you know, uh, affluent elite farmers to, to demonstrate it and become part of the training program, etc. And they'd got the media in to give a lot of, uh, of attention. And they said, you know, this could lead to a new white revolution. And I presume they mean white in the sense of like mountains of polished uh, rice grain uh, in the fields, um, etc. But once again, <laughs> we get to the uh, villages where this was trialed four years later, and we can find very scanty presence of not just this KRH4, but other competing hybrid rices produced by uh, private sector and so forth. So if you, uh, there's a pattern emerging here. If, if, like, if any of you guys like develop an agricultural technology, simply do not get me to come and look at it because I'm like the kiss of death for this stuff, right? Uh, you can, the, I go into the fields and whatever it was, it just doesn't exist anymore when I get there. And then it changes the research to question, well, why not? Okay, and and this this is a, a a complex question, but it has much to do with the social composition of rural India, the changing social composition of class, social class polarization, etc. So, um, if you note this this field or this this um, this, this uh, table I'm putting up here, it shows you how many farms are what kind of size. So you'll see that the most farms are marginal. You know, they're around two two point five. Uh, um, acres, and that's the vast majority of smallholders have really small farms, um, and then small, and then you know there's very few uh, 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 larger landholders in it, but they do exist, etc. And they hold a fair amount of land, as you can look on the percentage of land. But this is really a territory dominated by marginal and small farmers. And the question that comes up, that, that, that despite the best of intentions of the agricultural scientists who really believe they had truly created a remarkable new variety of rice, they were creating a solution, hybrid rice, to a question that farmers weren't asking. That is that hybrid rice tends to be a more expensive rice, you, you pay more, 
and it tends to be more input expensive. This is uh, sorry, input intensive. That is that it's a rice specifically designed to rapaciously draw nutrients from the soil. So it requires lots of fertilization in an input intensive system to be able to create all that rice uh, uh, grain at the other side, right? So it's specifically designed to, to work, to draw up nutrients from the soil. So you have to have an intensive fertilizer regime. And this was, you know, on the one hand, high risk, high reward kind of agriculture. And it was just discernibly what most smaller marginal farmers were not looking for. They're worried that one, if you have to buy more inputs at the start of the season, that means you need more credit at the start of the season, which means you're going to higher debt. And most debts in this region are completely informal to people like the storekeeper that I was talking about previously, uh, to p village landowners, merchants, etc. Uh, maybe from microfinance, and maybe if you have land as collateral from a bank, but for most of them not. So you're going into debt at the beginning of season, and let's just be clear, the weather, despite the, the, the climate thing, uh, situation, uh, we got there in the third year of drought. The drought has been intense, okay? And irrigation, re irrigation waters are not making their way down the canals as they once used to. So even those that thought they had irrigation on tap are not finding them. So there's one, there's the sort of agroecological agro risks of if you use the fertilizers wrongly, this degrades the soil and ruins your soil for the next couple of years. Uh, so there's a lot of risk of, of poor cultivation practices. There's a credit risk. You've invested so much. If the rains don't come and then your rice doesn't grow, you've invested more, so you lose more. Uh, and also farmers develop, devote a substantial amount of their rice production for home subsistence consumption. And they just don't like hybrid rice. They just don't like the taste. They say it's crap. So this is a bit of a problem, right? Because then they didn't give them the flexibility to either sell it or consume it as they needed. And they needed that flexibility. So when we're sort of talking to farmers, and this is one of the original sites where it was really promoted, where the university went to task, that photo in the top right was this sort of celebration of the first year of KRH4 being grown in this village, Katadodi, etc. And um, we went there four years after, and all the farmers that had been part of the trials, etc. weren't using it. And what they had done, which was very interesting, was either return to standard rice varieties which they had good ways of selling to local markets, et cetera, or they'd moved in completely the other direction and they'd gone what you might call more agroecological agro forms of farming. And this was low input farming. And they were doing this for a, a significant reason, not because it produced great bountiful yields, it was very difficult to do, but because of less risk. If you did went into less inputs at the beginning of year, less chance of taking on debt, etc. And this is because households were diversifying their portfolios substantially, their livelihoods, etc. For this class of farmers, it was about having kids working in factories or in the cities and agriculture forming one part of a more subsistence orientated practice with some surplus market, etc., but mainly providing food for a household which was growing, doing its income from other means. Hybrid rice did not appeal to these. In another village, uh, uh, Kaifanahali, uh, uh, which was closer to the river and therefore better irrigation, we found two different classes of farmers using it. More affluent farmers saw it as worthwhile having high risk, high reward strategy because they once again exercise more control over both the ecological and social environment to, to minimize the risks. And they are well clued into agricultural extension networks to get knowledge from, uh, from the university, etc. And they've done reasonably well with hybrid rice. They say, hey, it takes a ton of fertilizer, but we've increased yields. So this is not surprising. We've seen many cases that like more elite farmers are the first wave of adopters of new technologies, etc. But what did surprise us was the other social class using this high risk strategy were the ones that intuitively we felt were the least able to do it. And this was landless farmers. These were guys that were, they were all men. They were renting land and they'd gone into significant debt in order to rent land from absentee landlords uh, to buy the inputs, etc. And their position was so precarious that just growing standard rice didn't seem like it would make enough money to be able to repay their debts at the end of the year. So they were gambling it all on the high 
uh, risk high reward potentiality of hybrid rice. But they were ironically those least able to shoulder that risk and least able to control the factors about it. So this was, you know, this was interesting to see that this the, the cl a class that was so uh, polarized off the bottom margin that they were the ones adopting this sort of agricultural technology, which you would assume they would be the last to do it because of the risk involved. But they felt they had no choice but to do this. So this second point that comes out of this research is that new agricultural technologies both reflect and help shape active processes of social polarization, of class fragmentation way we're getting a certain class where agriculture is not so much about the yield, but is about minimizing risks, a return of a sort of peasantry mentality within that, vis-a-vis -vis more affluent elite farmers that are trying these new technologies. And then at the bottom, another class of farmers that can't afford to take risks, but they can't afford not to take the risks. So agricultural technologies really get intermixed with these kinds of trains of social polarization. Um, I can't actually see uh, my, my computer's clock at the moment, so I have no idea how I'm doing for time. Uh, but I'm going to quickly whip through one last case study and try and wrap up. So I'm guessing I'm probably getting fairly close to being done. Yeah, if you could um, wrap up in about five minutes, if that poss that's possible. Certainly, that would be absolutely. So thanks for your patience here. So um, the last study that we did, and I'll make this really brief. This was in Tunkuru district in Karnataka. It's a hilly region, so it looks quite different from the others. And we focused here on a new project by uh, the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, which was a big institution set up to promote green revolution technologies. And they wanted to create 100 model villages for climate resilience. And these were meant to be beacons. They were all over the country, beacons of the best technologies, etc., to be used to promote climate resilience. Uh, again, it's technological centered. It is a focused on new technologies as the solution to climate uh, problems. So this, this region looks different. It's a hilly area. There is uh, lots of uh, sort of uh, mountainous, hilly areas. Uh, all the uh, all the, the the villages on this side of the village of Naganahalli, which is one of these hundred climate villages, uh, wanted to talk about was the leopards getting pushed out of the hills and eating their livestock, etc. Extremely dry, extremely arid. Once again, uh, but what this climate resilience project had done, it done three things. Firstly, uh, it had tried to distribute new types of seeds and practices amongst the people, particularly our idea of drought resistant seeds for millet production and the practices of intercropping. So you grow millet along with uh, gram uh, lentils, along with millet lentils, etc. And then maybe some flowers and so forth, all in the same field. So this kind of idea of diversifying agriculture, etc. Notably, as I'll very briefly point on, many farmers had said, hey, we're already doing this. We've been doing this for generations. The, the, the agricultural experts said, well, they were doing it, but we've perfected it, et cetera. And a sort of bit of an argument was going on. But distributing drought resistant seeds uh, was part of this. Uh, but the other side of it was a focus on watershed development. And over one side of the village, there had been you know, thousands upon thousands of rupees divest, uh, invested into shaping the flows of water off the mountain sides and into fields and trying to create storage ponds and so forth, new water courses, some concrete poured, the lots of digging, etc. within this. Uh, and this had been moderately successful. True, it only affected one side of the village and the villages over the other side, the, the, the west side, which I showed previously, were not part of this. So it was geographically specific. It cost a ton of money. So how replicable this model village is going to be was very much under, uh, under, under doubt. This was very much a showcase village and a showcase for external eyes as much as the people within it. And it did in create a new dynamic of who controlled water. If you were lucky enough that the new channels of water flow through your fields and you could invest the money into pipe technologies, into creating draining ponds, drainage ponds, etc., you had control over water, which you could then sell to neighbors, etc., just by the kind of geographical accident of where your fields were. And of course, if you own more land, more chance that the water is going to run through it at, your, uh, at some point. So it created new dynamics of water ownership and water control. But it was broadly seen as quite positive and allowing rice farmers to continue producing rice where they're worried that they wouldn't be able to without this. Uh, 
And the third aspect was agroforestry. And this is kind of mixed cropping. You'll see this sign here says, you know, uh, mango trees, mixed uh, hardwood tree species and groundnut or often ragi millets on the ground under these trees. And this was amazing success in, in ecological terms. A lot of wasteland had been turned over to agroforestry initiatives. Uh, and, and in many respects, my, my colleague and I were really impressed by this until we realized the degree to which the benefits of this side of the pr program had been uh, captured by a small handful of farmers. And when we realized the extent of elite capture of this program, our jaws dropped. Uh, it was stunning. Um, as uh, one of the leading families who had set them up as the sort of gatekeepers for this climate resilience village, they had managed to get the entirety of their lands uh, redeveloped as agroforestry. Wonderful ecological success. People coming from South Africa to, to purchase Indian gooseberry and look at the technology, etc. But they had literally had thousands of trees planted on their land and monopolize the processing side of things, etc. This was accumulation by climate change resilience, uh, an amazing shifting of accumulation of, of social, uh, social polarization with the village because they've been able to grab these aspects of it. So an interesting situation in which climate resilience, as in diversified agriculture, was captured by very few people as part of an accumulation strategy. And it really made me think about resilience. And I'll, I'll end with this last, last aspect. On the, if we went back to the west side of the village, and I talked with some of the farmers over here, and I tried to express the idea of resilience, which is a big buzzword, to them. And they said, you know, for us, resilience isn't about the threat of climate change so much. We do these things of diversifying our different lentils, etc. Resilience for us is about moderating, about mediating our relationship with the market, mediating our relationship with up and down of prices, and particularly avoiding becoming indebted. And so for them, climate resilience was not so much about droughts, changing water, etc., Climate change expressed itself most dramatically to them in relations of debt. And the fact that they might become indebted to the same families that had gained off of this aspect. So this is my final point here. I would argue provocative that climate change is manifested most explicitly, not through drought, not through changing thermal stress and crops, etc., but people find it most tangibly through relations of debt. And this is precisely kind of idea that just does not show up in official representations of what climate change is about. Climate change adaptation in these Indian areas is all about new technologies to deal with drought, to deal with changing water flows, etc. But the heart of the matter for most smallholders was questions about debt and their relationships with informal lenders, money lenders, and so forth, and the relationship with the market. And this was entirely a different idea of resilience, which really ran counter to official projections of new grain revolution, of market-orientated farmers were using extremely technologically sophisticated crops and so forth. It was far more guarded about not wanting to become the victim of debt. So I'll leave it there. I've probably overshot my time. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you very much for allowing me to, um, to talk to you virtually. I hope this was okay. Thank you very much. Marcus, thank you so much for a really interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, we're now going to go to our two discussants, um, Kate Soper and Nithya Natarajan who are going to talk for five to seven minutes each. Um, so I will um, hand over to Nithya first. Hello. Um, OK. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus, for that incredibly interesting talk. Um, I don't know if you can see, but you have quite a full room here in one of SOAS's larger lecture theatres. Um, I mean, SOAS not being a huge university in itself, but, um, yeah, really, really interesting talk um, that's dragged us all here on a very sunny afternoon, so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, I guess I, I just wanted to ask um, a set of smaller provocations, questions, uh, however you want to phrase them, um, linked to three different aspects of your, of your talk, very briefly. Um, the first is around your theoretical framing. 
And then the second and third are really to, to ask you a bit more of, um, you know, we've heard this incredibly strong and interesting critique, um, but, but what would you sort of advocate, I guess, um, would, would be the, the second aspect. Um, so asking about, firstly, your theoretical framing, um, you mentioned at the start that you have this uh, particular rendering of political ecology which brings together agrarian political economy and uh, Latour, um, which you did say was the more kind of controversial of the, of the <laughs> different bits. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about that um, and how you can sort of square them being together in a framing. Um, so uh, thinking about how both um, critical agrarian uh, political economy, so Henry Bernstein would understand nature and how Bruno Latour understands nature, um, Bernstein's understanding seems to be, as you yourself said, a bit more inert, um, maybe we could use the term realist, um, coming from, I guess, a more um, orthodox Marxist position saying um, nature is not an active kind of intention-having agent in, in the process mm. of social change, rather it's the social aspect that makes um, or, or has an impact on, on nature. And then squaring that with Latour, who, who does very much flirt with the idea that nature or natural um, elements can, can make uh, social relations. Um, and I wondered where you sat, if you could talk a bit more about yeah. your, your kind of understanding of that. Um, and then the second question is really, um, so we've heard, I mean, your critique of the, of the different technologies is really uh, convincing and, and interesting. And I just wonder, um, think going, thinking about the way that you've talked about, I guess I, I'd use the term, you know, and, and maybe used it earlier, fetishization. So the idea that, you know, the Indian government has taken these technologies to be a kind of panacea, um, and, and that is a problem, as you say, and they have social, they're rooted in kind of social relations which are found to be the things that hinder them from working. But I guess, does, I, w I would like to know more about whether you think that means all technology or any technology is just necessarily not something we on the left as progressives should, should ever advocate. Are there social relations in which technology could be um, a kind of a positive force or, or would you say that the entire notion of, of technology or um, kind of yield increasing agriculture is something that we shouldn't uh, think about? Because um, well, I'm, th I'm thinking specifically of, for example, um, uh, Bernstein's critique of, of food sovereignty literature, where he mm -hmm. kind of says, you know, I, I don't want to be a farmer. I live in a city. I'm quite happy not being a farmer. And so if we can't all grow our own food, someone needs to grow food for us. And so the idea of yield being higher in itself, are we, are we saying that that's necessarily a bad thing? Um, it would be good to hear more on that. And then the third issue um, is, is uh, asking a bit more about... Um, the, the kind of uh, social relations that you talked about in relation to uh, what I think are prob is probably the biggest, um, and, and you touched on it strongly in the third case, the biggest social relation that structures an Indian village, which is caste. Um, yes. To what extent are these technologies being hindered by caste? So to what extent would, would a progressive agenda just say, you know what, we just need to address caste or, or mm -hmm. uh, gender as, as relations of inequality, and that will allow... Um, where does the kind of solution or, or, or progressive uh, agenda for, for thinking ahead lie more in the social relations and less in, in rejecting the technology or, or perhaps as a space in the middle? Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nithya. I'll now hand over to Kate. Yes. Thank you for a very interesting and, uh, as far as I'm concerned, very informative paper because I... Uh, I can only offer very general comments, having no um, uh, um, expert knowledge at all about India and the promotion of the New Green Revolution there. Um, first, I, though, I wanted to just comment um, on your conclusion from your case studies that um, we need to be closely attuned to who has power to represent rural India, including how key problems are identified and solutions posed. And I, I absolutely agree um, in the most general sense that the issues of power and representation are key to resolving issues of climate change. And I thought your account of this really beautifully illustrated the implication of social and natural factors in confounding simplistic technological aspirations. I also thought it was very interesting, the role played by class and 
gender and conventions of what counts as male or female work in determining the obstacles to new technologies. I suppose my main question here, and I think it's an echo area of what Nicholas raises, is what the reaction to this might or ideally should be. Uh, which, as it were, do we, do, we, do we argue needs to be adjusted? Or both, is, are we, is it the social relations need to be adjusted to the technology or the technology to the social relations? Or are we thinking here in terms of some possible dialectical uni uni unity of, of, of transformation? And how, in any case, might that be achieved? <clears throat> But one thing that um, does seem clear is that technology is not in itself um, enough. It can't achieve the kind of political changes essential to promoting more eco-benign agricultural management. And I got from your paper a sense that you did want to promote these, that it's not simply a straightforward anti-technology uh, argument that you're developing. On the other hand, in some cases, technology, as you reveal, is clearly a factor in creating the climate conditions, the unpredictable water supply, heavy use of fertilizers, and so on, that interferes with the smooth adoption of new technical measures. And there's even a suggestion here that technology perpetuates some of the class or gender relations that distrain on its own impact. I have in mind what you say about the perception of technology as a male affair. So, but, you know, against that, it's also the case that, that some of the social relations getting in the way of the new Green Deal are not themselves very emancipated. So we've got a kind of nexus here of tensions in which social problems get in the way of possibly progressive environmental uh, um, uh, uh, technologies and vice versa and you know the issue is how do we actually unlock that and for me there's there's definitely a, a parallel of some kind though it's very far from exact in trusting to technology more generally uh, to solve the problems of climate change including in the more developed world and that's been a, a, a theme of my own work on Western consumption where I focused on the need to challenge consumerist and technically driven conceptions of progress and the good life as a condition of creating a relay of pressures for greater global justice. And critical here, I've argued, is the representation of what I've called an alternative politics of prosperity, one that challenges the growth economy and the pretensions of the eco-modernizers to create a sustainable future through purely technical fixes. So it would be interesting to sort of hear, Marcus, what you felt about the possible parallels or contrasts uh, here. Um, I mean, I think the approach I'm arguing for here can be aligned in some ways with earlier and more traditional, even if you like, romantic antipathies to the modern. Um, but I think it also needs to reject the puritanical and socially conservative aspects of traditional cultures of resistance to, to modernity. So, you know, in a sense, I'm sort of talking here about a perspective that would endorse a form of modernization and its representation that severed the link between progress and economic expansion while opposing the cultural regression and social conservatism that have hitherto tended to go together with economic backwardness. Um, lastly, just a word, uh, I too want to kind of raise, I think, uh, the, the, the nature versus the social issue, and I just wanted to comment briefly on what's been said in the paper about the presumptions of anthropocentric uh, causality. Mm especially your point that there are no clear lines to be drawn here between the social and the natural. 
Um, and that in recognizing that the invocation here, the complexity of it, um, you advise us to, as you put it, I think, to be bolder within our analytic frameworks. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree that there is that kind of nexus, as it were, this interaction, but I think, I mean, I think my position would be that being bold within our analytic frameworks means insisting against some tendencies in recent theory to collapse the nature culture, mm -hmm. culture social binaries, that even as we recognize the extent to which nature conceived as material properties and processes is constitutive of the social, as you say, yes. we need also actually to maintain an analytic uh, distinction between nature and society. So, you know, I just want, in a sense, along those lines to add a note of qualification to your claim that there are no clear lines to be drawn between the social and the natural. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, in, in addition uh, there, um, I would agree that um, with what's been said already, I think that we can recognize that objects can have extensive uh, formative influence on humans and that they generate their own consequences. But that, I think, is very different from imputing anything comparable to human powers of agency. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I'd, I would want to dispute the wisdom of those who in recent times have positioned themselves as friends of nature precisely by denying the subject-object and nature-cultural mm -hmm. distinctions. And I rather agree with Alf Hornborg when he says that the most problematic implication of attempts to dissolve the subject-object or nature-social distinctions is not the fetishistic attribution of agency to non-living entities, but the withdrawal of responsibility and accountability from human subjects. So I just, you know, I just, I think maybe there isn't any implication of that kind in what you're saying, Marcus, but I, you know, I would quite like that to be clarified, yeah. For sure. Thank you very much, um, both Nithia and Kate. Um, Marcus, what I think we'll do now is um, go to the floor for some questions, um, get three or four questions, and then, then we can um, hand over to you to respond to those and also to anything you want to respond to from Nithia and Kate. Is that okay? That's, that's great. Just, just to, to note that I'm afraid, dear audience, I cannot see you at all. So uh, forgive me. If you could perhaps introduce who you are, just so I, I, I can't... I can't see you, but at least I can hear who you are. That would be wonderful. Great, and we have a microphone for the audience members as well. So. Hi, uh, Marcus, thank you for that, that was great. Uh, my name's Robert, I'm from Keynes in the Department of Global Health. Um, so I'm wondering about your characterization of debt so we've been looking at some things in Malawi and uh, also Ethiopia, and debt isn't always cash. Debt can also yeah. be things like side selling. It can be things, you know, so we've seen farmers that will take contract farm, farming deals, and then end up actually not you know, going through with those deals where they have guaranteed buyers, although they've already received the seed uh, beforehand because they found better deals. So they, they've kind of been negotiating the other ways and moving around their capital strategically to do that. So have you seen mm. debts uh, happening in, in other ways, in more of an emerging market than we might be seeing in Sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, good question. Okay. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk, Marcus. I really enjoyed your case studies. Uh, my name is Irin Perucha. I'm at the Global Sustainability <coughs> Institute at Anglia Ruskin University, where I co-lead the risk and resilience research theme. So some of what you're saying is actually very pertinent to questions and tensions we've been exploring around enabling climate resilience and understanding um, how to scale up uh, climate resilience. And our own work as human geographers and political ecologists interested in deconstructing yeah. who benefits, why, and um, 
some of the more perverse impacts of some of these technologies. I really liked your phrase about accumulation by climate change resilience. That's exactly the kind of thing that we're mm -hmm. wary of. But then my question is, and this, is, this may not be something you can answer definitively, but I struggle with this a lot, which is, what is one to do? Um, <laughs> one's instincts as a political ecologist are very much towards deconstruction and unpacking. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, one's instinct to someone who is <coughs> very concerned about climate resilience um, is to look for what works, why does it work, uh, how can we make it work more and yeah. better. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave that with you. And if you have anything that might illuminate that, that would be very helpful to hear. Thanks. No, that's great. Hi, Marcus. I'm Jens Lerge from SOAS and also from Journal of Grain Change. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear you talk and, and of course, also to uh, have read your paper on which is based in Journal of Grain Change, 19.1. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, um, so two, one, one common question and, and, and one question. Um, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's, it strikes me that, that, that the social processes that you're looking at are... are are age old in India, and and one aspect of the first green revolution that Terry Bias uh, pointed out was that the first green revolution was uh, maybe scale neutral, but it wasn't resource neutral, and it seems to me that that, that is really what we're seeing with the SRI as well. But does does that mean that that one simply has to accept that as long as government of India will not put in place systems to support small farmers to 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 cope with with, with the peak in in uh, labor input and water and so on that uh, uh, to introduce these kind of of of, of uh, um, uh, technologies does mean speeding up uh, peasant differentiation and there's yeah. a trade-off uh, that that if we want uh, technologies that, that can do these things, then the trade-off is increased peasant differentiation. So, so, so that's a, the comment and the question. But, but relating to that is also, uh, what um, uh, is there always a trade-off between uh, 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 technologies that are uh, more in, environmentally sound, but also produce a higher uh, uh, output and labor input. So does it always mean that peasant households have to work harder, or at least in, in, in peaks, uh, in order to produce uh, more if they are not simply going for uh, um, uh, uh, GMO seeds, etc.? Mm -hmm. Because then, does that mean that peasants will have to, in a sense, bear the burden for introducing these kind of, 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 of new technologies, and in particular, uh, in India, women, female members of the households will have to yeah. bear the burden. Thanks. Great. Cool. Okay. Um, as there seem to be no more questions at the moment, perhaps we can um, hand um, over to you, Marcus, to respond, and then we can take another round after that. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, great questions. I, I feel like I should log off, take an hour to a couple of days to think about it, let you enjoy your sunshine and come back, but um, not allowed to do that. So let me take a running jump at some of these questions. Just, just to be clear, I constantly beat myself up at having not better answers to the what is to be done question. So I'll try and answer it the best I can and et cetera, but um, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough one, right? So, uh, so it, it's, it's hard there. Um, I'm, I'm, just by the way, that you guys have got lovely weather there. Is if you were if you were here, it's like minus fifteen outside. You you're lucky where you are right at the moment. Climate change or not, that's cool. Um, okay, political ecology and 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 thank you so much for uh, Nifia and and Kate for the pushing me on 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 this actor network theory on this Luturian influence in my work. Uh, I I get this a lot. Um, so let let me be clear. I, I certainly don't intend in any way to try and create this kind of leveling out of, of, of playing fields just that 
firstly, that non-human uh, actants in Latour's language have agency in the same way that humans do, uh, to try and flatten out the social field in this respect. Um, um, to be clear, uh, I think it's really important to understand that humans are the predominant environment makers out there, right? We are constantly producing and reproducing and shifting and transforming our environments. But we do so, so in relation to energies, processes, etc., that are not our own. So, for example, if we think about system rice intensification, it's really important to understand that we need to, to analyze these processes in a way that looks at human agency to, to try and reshape water flows, to try and reshape the way that microbes work in the soil with the roots of the rice, et cetera, and to be really open to that field of relationships, to understand the relationships of debt in a village are being shaped, as it were, by this broader field of relationships involving microbes, involving fertilizer, et cetera, uh, and so it's, it's more a sort of heuristic device for me to, to when I approach a case study uh, and an issue, to really keep an open mind to what is causing what, in what kind of relational field. But I would never doubt that that kind of what we call social element, uh, even though it is not, it's social and natural simultaneously, is the leading force in what is recreating, reproducing both the, the, the human and the uh, biophysical landscape. Um, absolutely. So I'm not interested in this sort of flattening out of everything that kind of lets humans off the hook for, for, for the stuff we're doing. Uh, but rather, it's a device by which to really look at case studies in, in more focused detail to try and pick up on elements that sometimes are missed out as really important determining forces if we're too focused just on the social relations of debt, commodities, et cetera, without sort of knitting those in to those kind of biophysical processes and so forth. And I think we should be open to that. And that's what I mean in terms of boldness, because very often that, that divide can often just fall on the side of social scientists versus natural scientists where I think we need to be open to the kind of work that really tries to pick up on that. Uh, and it allows much more nuanced detail between different case studies. Because, for example, with that system of rice intensification thing, it really mattered what kind of soil that you were like uh, pushing your weeder on to the effect. So to create a general thing about shifting gender relations because of the shift of technology, actually in some Areas where the soil was really red soil, uh, chaka, uh, this is kind of soil which is really dry. It's easy to push, and that, that just wasn't a factor there. So we needed to be really uh, sort of tuned into that. And uh, to my perspective, it makes it much easier to get tuned into those dynamics if you open yourself to them explicitly at the start. But um, So that's where I come to that from. I'm certainly... I, I, I don't read the Latorian stuff that goes farther than that. So, Kate, I hope I can rest, uh, give you some peace of mind on that. But I do feel that it's useful in opening our mind to other approaches to thinking about what we need to ask and what we need to look for if we're doing field work and so forth. Um, Nifia's point about the fetishization of technology is yield a bad thing, uh, etc. Um, I'm, you know, really open. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that the technologies are bad in or good in and of themselves at all. Uh, technologies serve certain purposes and they serve certain people's purposes by the way that they're embedded in particular social relations and so forth. So I would never want to foreclose my mind that some of these uh, technologies cannot be useful. In fact, they, all of them were very useful to certain people in certain social groups, etc. Extremely useful. Um, but unless we start to think how they're socially situated, uh, then, then you know, we want to avoid any kind of blanket a priori characterizations of them as good as bad. Personally, I think the system of rice intensification should have a seriously good role to play in rural India. And there's parts of rural India where um, this has gone, it's much more prevalent than uh, Mahabugnagar. 
uh, and and I didn't bring it up in in the lecture, but I, I also I was looking at the same thing in Karnataka. I, in fact, I went to, to Karnataka to look again at system rice certification. But when I found very few people using it there again, but this hybrid rice thing, I thought, ah, shift in direction. Um, so we need to understand now. The debates over, say, the system of rice intensification tend to get very polarized between one group of agronomists who say it works, it's brilliant, and another group of economists that say it's voodoo, it doesn't work. There's better, best practice in other things that do it. And it just comes down to this question of the idea of does system of rice intensification work? And, and this is just the wrong way to think about it. And so the direction of, of the work I'm doing, and this applies for the hybrid rice and the agroforest and so forth, is who does it work for and why? And only when asking those kind of questions and getting away the blanket idea, and the agronomists are terrible for this, apologies to any agronomists in the audience, but um, you know, of just sort of saying, you know, it works. So it, we just roll it out, but no, it's far more nuanced, et cetera. Is there a way to create a, a space for hybrid rice to raise yields, et cetera? Um, I find that less likely because of the way the fact that yield, that kind of yield increase from using it isn't worthwhile for smallholder farmers vis-a-vis -vis the extra potential to be indebted and the high risks involved. So for me, uh, if, if we're looking at technologies for smallholders, et cetera, we should be thinking uh, about different kinds of rice varieties. And, and, and does agricultural science have a role to play in that? Absolutely. But when agricultural scientists just avoid asking the question of who can use this thing, that's when we get into trouble that we see with the hybrid rice. And they create a mirage of a success story because they need funding and they need to create a success because partially they needed to get this hybrid rice commercialized at the other end and they want to sell it to the private sector. And that's become an important point of their job. Uh, is to demonstrate success by the commercialization of a new technology at the research site. So they actually went all out to create a sort of mirage of successful uptake and adopt, adoption in the fields. And they went to great lengths to do this. And so when we get there and, and there's no one using it and we're like, well, hold on, we read all the accounts that everyone's using this. It was, so they're, they're under huge pressures in a, in a much more corporate research structure, even though they're in the public sector, selling the intellectual property to the private sector is seen as the mark of success. Um, this is, I, I do this longer thing of hybrid rice now, it's in a, a paper that's coming out in Journal of Peasant Studies uh, very shortly, it should be up online. You can see the full paper on my research uh, um, gate site. It's, I got that slide up somewhere. Um, but yeah, so this is an interesting dynamic. So they were pushed to create a success out of this, even though it wasn't the answer to what people were looking. I think Sri is much more potential within this. And, and the other thing, you know, the, 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 the agroforestry and the questions of intercropping and so forth, I think these are absolutely necessary. Uh, it's horrendous when they were captured to the degree they were in the village. Because at that point, I was looking around thinking, hey, this is some pretty innovative stuff. And some of the farmers were saying, yes, we already do the intercropping of millets, lentils, uh, maize, uh, and other aspects. And, and I think scientists had a role in uh, improving the way they're doing it, but the scientists were laying claim as if they'd found this and discovered it, and then and it was like trying to sell it back to the people that actually did. But a, a better dialogue around that, those kind of processes, technologies, the new seeds, this kind of drought resistant seeds uh, or shorter germination. I, most farmers said these are hey, these are good. We like these. There you go. Uh, a technology helped develop in the university system. Yes good technology, etc. And it aimed for something that people are actually cultivating, ragi, millet. So yeah, those kind of technologies were good, but they're aimed appropriately. But the more dramatic things of, uh, of the sort of technology, the cutting edge often were for showcase for outside visitors more than people. And, and, and so there those social relations around it made it very inappropriate. So, so it's that kind of thing. I mean, no, climate smart agriculture, I've been very critical of it. I wrote uh, another paper just critiquing it because it evacuates the discourse of all these kind of questions of hierarchy, power, social inequality, and just looks at technologies as if they're outside of social context. So sure, we can all agree that we'd love increased yields, better climate resilience, whatever we quite mean by that, which is another question, and, um, and less emissions. Can I sign up to that? 
hundred percent. I don't think anyone, and no one would want to pretend that they didn't agree with that, right? But how we get there, and by whom, what mechanisms? Those political questions. That discourse tries to isolate them and push them out, and that leads to bad policy, in my opinion. And so we need to be guarded about these kind of technologies and so forth. Uh, the question about caste, um, it was it was hard for myself to get people to open up about caste in a way that uh, they love talking about agriculture technology. Farmers just love to tell me what they did in the greatest detail. And I was so interested, et cetera. And I could get through to much of the, the sort of finance and land ownership and so forth. Caste was very difficult for myself, a researcher like myself to get into. I would note, and so I didn't talk about it too much. One aspect comes up in the system of rice identification is about knowledge and knowledge flow, flowing through networks of agricultural extension officers down to farmers. And I did see evidence that there were caste dimensions to that because those kind of social networks through which knowledge flows, people were excluded. And there was definitely some aspects of caste uh, within that. I couldn't quite say with precision I wanted to, but I do comment it on it in the in the three paper. In the hybrid rice, um, there was less caste dimensions to the uh, villagers. It was um, more homogenous in terms of uh, the backward caste uh, composition. And certainly, again, in the village where the climate smart climate resilient agriculture techniques were appropriated, there was a class. Uh, difference to who got what. Sure, you can have the drought resilient seeds. Those went certainly to people of all castes, but some of those most lucrative, accumulative aspects were definitely taken by not high caste, but we're, we're talking middle, uh, sort of other backward castes here rather than um, uh, Dalit schedule tribe uh, and so forth. So there's a strong caste dimension. Uh, I could only scratch the surface of that. I understand that other research would be much better position to get to that. It's definitely there, but it, it you know, the caste vis-a-vis -vis land holdings, vis-a-vis -vis access to water control, it, it really comes together in, in that sort of class, caste and gender aspect uh, that makes it hard to pick apart because they're so integral. So it should be a bigger part of the research I've done, uh, but I wasn't able to become more definitive about it. Marcus, I, I know yep. you haven't had the chance to answer everything yet, but we'd okay, love to get the chance to get in a couple more questions oh, please, and then, please, then hand back Thank to you one more time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hi, hello, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, <laughs> not morning, everyone. Um, Marcus, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. My name is Livia Cabral. I'm a fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, uh, Sussex. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm currently uh, look, starting to look comparatively at the history of the Green Revolutions in, uh, in India, China, and, and Brazil. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm interested in the way that uh, the more recent experience relates to that early, early um, chapter of this uh, long uh, Green Revolution uh, history. So my question mm -hmm. is around the, um, the higher level politics of, in um, science and technology production. Um, mm. And what purpose these uh, government programs um, really serve. Um, to those that are uh, driving them. So uh, how is this different today? from that uh, earlier stage of the Green Revolution in terms of those higher level politics that, that are behind um, uh, these government-led uh, programs. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, my name is Richard Vokes. I'm a sort of semi-retired development economist, uh, almost certainly the oldest person here, having done my research on Green Revolution in, um, in the mid-70s. And... Um, what I found, and therefore following that last comment, quite uh, interesting. Um, what I've, First of all, I'm interested that many of the things that you've raised have indeed were very much uh, present, obviously, in the first uh, Green Revolution. Yes. And um, you know, it, was, it reminded me of some of the studies on the resistance um, to IR8, IR5, and so on when they uh, came in. I should say that I work mainly on Southeast Asia for the uh, Green Revolution. But also in the context of India, um, and looking at the three case studies in the areas where you were um, working, the first and the last one 
didn't seem to be areas that were very well suited to rice anyway. Yeah. I mean, obviously the last one, they were anyway, uh, you say traditionally the farmers were, were into cropping and so on. Um, but the first area, I also wonder to what extent part of the problem is again the government pushing rice, pushing tube well irrigation, um, which is again, generally the farmers don't have to pay for electricity. So this whole problem of mining of the aquifers throughout yeah. India um, is a very major issue. And that in fact a much bigger change is required in terms of the kind of cropping systems. Yes. Yeah. Are there any final burning questions? Hello, Professor Marcus. Uh, I'm Boris Kaido uh, from Tokyo University, Japan. And also mm. I come, I've come from Indonesia yeah, as a developing country. So I, my question is, uh, you said that technology not only useful, uh, not only main important things, but uh, in terms of agriculture, especially in Indonesia, my country, uh, the big problem is not to make a pro uh, the big problem how to make the productive uh, for the production and yeah. and also in my my country indonesia government uh, the first the first thing is push uh, for the new technology yes yeah and and then uh, how do you think about this case is it uh, we we have to uh, push the new technology or the provide the, like a financial or access the market uh, good to, to the farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Um, if we can hand back to you, Marcus, and I'm so sorry to um, to request <laughs> that you that you respond and wrap up within five minutes because it's such an interesting discussion. But um, back to you, please. Okay, thank you so much. I, I mean, I can't quite get to everything. Obviously, I'll just try and pluck out a few key things and thank you so much all of you for your wonderful questions and patience and by all means write me we can take this stuff up or if you're a graduate student and want to come and do a MA PhD here in Canada write me as well I'll, I'll plug I'll plug Queens uh, anyway, sorry um, uh, productivity I think productivity is one of the words that we need to deconstruct more than we do. Productive of what? And it often just comes back to the question of yields. But we can think of agriculture as productive of all sorts of things. It's productive of landscapes. It's productive of environments. It's productive of livelihoods. And if we try to rethink productivity, I think that opens up a greater field for thinking about the relationship between technology, farmers, etc. What is it we're trying to produce? Uh, and obviously, you know, the idea of negative externalities of production doesn't really encompass the fullness of what productivity, if we open it up, can do, can do uh, right? So that's one of the questions about, you know, are we trying to create productive livelihoods that allow people that want to, to continue living and functioning in rural areas, particularly as, you know, urban migration to the cities, uh, India has a massive jobs problem. You know, so what is what is going on here? And many, you know, younger people say, no, I want to go to the city and to leave agriculture. It's better to work in factories, et cetera, and so forth. And, that, you know, so this is, creates a whole problem about what agriculture is meant to do. Now, in terms of different sort of visions of where it's going, rural India, I see plenty of these and different social movements pushing in different directions, including some which embrace the high level attempt to make Indian agriculture more modern. So the idea of what's this doing at a high level? Um, you know, the Modi government said we need to double farmer incomes. So that, you know, it's a huge high level politics about this. In, in Green Revolution, it used to be sort of the Malthusian specter of, of starvation. Uh, now the high level politics is around farmer suicides, rural distress, etc. So there's this program to double farmer incomes. But the means that they're using to do it are pretty much the ones I've outlined here. And there's a lot of emphasis on upgrading of technology, uh, market linkages, et cetera, uh, and, and, and this kind of thing. One wonders whether, you know, whether, it's, uh, whether we can think about things such as what people grow. So the question about rice, right? I mean, the idea that, that they're growing rice in Mahabug Nagar and, and, um, uh, and in Tumkur is... is it's, it's, you know, it didn't used to be grown. I mean, millet was the staple crop. Rice is relatively uh, new entrant into it, and it's a water-intensive crop. So absolutely, thinking about climate smart 
well, you can say we can grow climate smart technologies to grow rice, but if growing rice is stupid, then you're climate stupid technology, right? So the, the, putting it into that bigger picture of who's growing what, for what purposes, is, is really critical within this. Uh, there are lots of social movements out there pushing different versions of agroecology, some which, to come back to Kate's point, are anti-modern. And to come also back to Jens's point, uh, I've met a number of agro, uh, sort of organic farming. They won't call it that, actually. They hate that term. Uh, um, if you know the Suez Palakar uh, sort of um, natural farming uh, motive, and this is kind of wrapped up in a bit of sort of uh, indigenous idea of, of, of indigenous Indian techniques of, of farming, etc. It's quite reactionary. And there's certainly an emphasis that people just have to work harder. And these lazy people using these tractors and doing this, they're not true farmers, et cetera, and they're not being true to Indian farming. Uh, whereas there are other movements that are far more progressive in terms of the agroecology that really look at the social dimensions and look at diversified agriculture and that idea of resilience in a much more holistic, ecological and social framework. Uh, and they're very interesting and they're collecting traditional types of rice, not just to preserve them for what they are, but because that they do different things in an ecosystem and serve different aspects of productivity, productive of livelihoods, productive of resilience to different pests, different weather, etc. So I can certainly see those movements in there. And government tends to do this dance while on one hand it's saying, uh, we'll promote zero budget natural farming. And the other hand is promoting hybrid rice, et cetera. And it's trying to serve all these different social movements and consistencies at the same time. Just to be clear, the zero budget natural farming is really difficult. Many farmers come into it and think I can just pull back the chemicals out of the soil, but it takes the soil numerous years to really recover. So they get really low yields for a couple of years before it sort of bounced back. Plus there's a scale thing. And I think this is when we're, one area, if we want to think of resilience at a landscape level, it can't be left to too much to individual farmers because if you try and do zero budget natural farming in one field, you don't get the synergies of a landscape being farmed according to more agroecological things really small plots in amongst the sea of chemical agriculture, you're not going to get the kind of relationships between crop, microbes, uh, be beneficial uh, insect species, etc. Then if it's in, so scale is a huge issue. Um, uh, very lastly, because I've got to be quiet, is uh, the question of debt and what do we mean by debt? And I, I was definitely uh, insinuating it in more financial terms, but clearly debt can mean more in terms of social obligation. And we do see that in terms of you take this debt from me, but yes, you sell the rice back to me or you work in my fields, that kind of uh, coerced labor, et cetera, which Nifia would be uh, far better to speak about than that. But we definitely, definitely see debt, credit and debt in social and financial terms interlaced in complex and uh, new forms of dependency from that. Um, I'm going to stop now. I'm really sorry if I didn't touch on some of your questions, but thank you so much uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for a, a brilliant talk and a really interesting discussion afterwards. Um, and I'd also like to thank Nithya and Kate so much for their contributions.